Today's podcast is sponsored by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. There is strength in numbers. Join today at amac.us slash Carter. I'm very excited to bring to you today as a guest, Enrique Rick Prado. He is the author of Black Ops, The Life of a CIA Shadow Warrior. He had spent, Prado had spent decades with the CIA. Wait till you hear his stories. Wait till you hear where he's been, what's going on, and some of the missions that he is allowed to talk about now that are going to blow your mind. He served as a station chief in Central America and South America, also in the Philippines. He's fought in classified missions. Um, He's going to talk to us about China, Russia, what's happening now, and what happened then. You do not want to miss this interview, folks. I'm telling you right now, this guy, this guy is beyond the James Bond. Please follow and subscribe. Get all the links at sarahacarter.com. That's sarahacarter.com. And while you are there, I need you to sign up for our email list, right? This is important so that you do not get shadow banned. We do not want any of these behemoth social media um, organizations and companies silencing our voices. Go there, sarahacarter.com. While you are there, sign up for the email list so you don't get shadow banned. Listen, folks, right now you can get amazing discounts. I'm telling you from who? My friend Mike Lindell. Mike Lindell. And I saw him at CPAC. He was just amazing, standing up there, fighting the good fight at MyPillow.com. You go to my listeners page on MyPillow.com and enter the promo code CARTER, that's C-A-R-T-E-R. There are over 20 deals for you to choose from, including MyPillows as low as $19.98, Slippers at 50% off. Towel sets for only $39.99. I can go on and on and on. 60% off any Giza Dream Sheets with prices as low as $39.99. You just got to use the promo code CARTER, C-A-R-T-E-R. You will find all these offers and more at MyPillow.com. Click on Radio Listener Square. Use the promo code CARTER at checkout or call 1-800-685-7221. Right now, every order using promo code CARTER will receive Mike's new book, what are the odds from crack at it to CEO? You'll get that for free. MyPillow.com promo code Carter or call 1-800-685-7221. Don't forget code Carter for your free book. So I want you to think about this. Why did Putin announce he was putting his nuclear forces on alert? What do you think he's thinking? I'm going to tell you what I think he's thinking. Um. And I actually had a little bit of a chance to have a segue moment with KT McFarland. And I think you all know her. Um, she's a phenomenal um, national security analyst and somebody who spent uh, time with not only the Bush White House, but with President Trump's White House. And I just, I think she's brilliant. But we were talking about that very same question when we were at CPAC. And I kind of stopped her. We were both, she was in between speeches and I was walking uh, back there to give mine. And, you know, one of the things that I think Vladimir Putin is trying to do, and I'm not in agreement with people out there that think he's just lost his mind. He's completely nuts. He's out of it. Um, Vladimir Putin's been maniacal from the very beginning. There's been no difference in him. He went into Georgia. Um, He's threatening, you know, uh, Lithuania now. He um, he is he has uh, assassinated people throughout the world. He has always been a tough Russian KGB FSB guy. And he, he doesn't mess around, right? He is laying things out of the line. So he has a reason for putting these nuclear forces on alert. And I think what he is trying to do is break the back of NATO. And this is something that KT McFarland and I talked about. You know, I think that's the reason why he put troops near the Polish border I think this is the reason why we're seeing the threats against Lithuania. He obviously is, I think, concerned about the resistance that he is seeing in Ukraine. And of course, the people of Ukraine rising up and fighting. And believe me, believe me, the Ukrainian people are well-trained. They've been trained by the U.S. in the past. But more than that, they believe in freedom. I remember interviewing Ukrainians in 2013 and 2014 when they stood in Maidan against Yanukovych, and they were ready to fight then, and they are ready to fight now, and they are doing that. But they're still up against Russia, right? 
they are going to hold a long, I mean, this is going to be a long fight, a long drawn out fight that I agree with. But what I think Vladimir Putin wants to do, if he sees that the West, the United States and other Western nations continue to back, of course, uh, Zelensky's regime and the fight from the people on the streets, then he may try to push NATO and the NATO allies to prove themselves. And that is why I believe he put his nuclear forces on alert. He's trying to show the world that NATO really isn't NATO, that NATO is just an idea. It's there for looks. It's not, the NATO countries aren't really going to back each other. If, if we break Article 5, right, if he breaks Article 5, he, he steps into Poland, he goes into Lithuania, something happens, he's trying to see, is NATO really going to do what they say they're going to do? Are they really going to back the NATO allies? Or are we all going to be like, oops, okay, what do we do now? What do we do now? I don't know. I don't know. I do know that under President Trump, countries like Germany and other nations were told, hey, guess what? We're tired of carrying the weight here with NATO. We're tired of flipping the bill. You all have to do your part. And remember, people were like, Oh, President Trump. I mean, people went after him on this. I was talking to Ambassador Rick Grinnell about this when I was up as well at CPAC. And we had, you know, a little conversation. It was kind of funny. I'll I'll fill you in on this sidebar story. So I am standing in line like after midnight outside of the airport in Orlando with all my bags after coming from the truckers like in Las Vegas because I had been there that week. And I'm flying in for CPAC and I'm just exhausted. And I see this line that's never ending, right? It's like a taxi line that's never going to end. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to get to the hotel till 2.30 or 3 a.m. It's over for me. I'm just so exhausted. I'm going to sleep on my back. And then I hear someone say, hey, Sarah, Sarah, hey. And I turn around. There's Ambassador Ricker now. He's in the road. He's in the road with with a driver and two other people in the back of the car. There was this like guy I don't even know I think it was an Uber and he was hustling man he was getting people in the car and I was just like I'm I'm gone I'm leaving and I came running over so so Rick Grinnell like saved me from like a three-hour wait in a taxi line um, and we all drove together and we were talking and you know he was really tough on Germany he really laid the law down with Germany and he made so many great decisions you know, even against Iran, he got Germany to stop taking in the aircraft. Remember when Iran, uh, he punished them uh, with uh, their commercial flights coming into Germany, especially when we knew what the Iranians were doing, the biggest state sponsor of terrorism in the world, right? But let's talk about NATO and picking up their fair share. You know, now Germany realizes, oh, maybe I better beef up my defense spending. And the EU is sending weapons to Ukraine. Countries are denying flights from Aeroflot, which is actually not the best airline. You guys might not know this, but I did work for the airlines at one point in time when I was very young, um, in my early 20s. And uh, we used to get like a lot of reports that Aeroflot would carry like oxygen tanks on their flights. And that was a long time ago. They probably don't do that anymore. But that but I just want to warn you, Um, the sanctions are clamping down on Russian banks. But will this be enough? I don't think so. I think the only thing that we can count on right now is if Biden just, I'm telling you, he just ties a knot into Russia's energy and he does not allow any more Russian energy sales. I mean, we have to become energy independent and we have to punish Russia, punish Russia. We are not punishing them now. We are actually helping fund their war against Ukraine because we buy Russian energy right? Gas. And we're not stopping it. And that is a huge, huge problem. I want you to listen to this clip. This is Jen Psaki pretending that we can be energy independent on green energy. And uh, we can't. I mean, it'll take like, I mean, it'll just, it just won't happen right now. Uh, We have to do the first thing. We have to become energy independent with our gas. We need to open the Keystone Pipeline again, and we need to put America first. Listen to Jen Psaki. 
on oil leases, what this actually justifies in President Biden's view is the fact that we need to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, on oil in general, and need to and we need to look at other ways of process of having energy in our country and others. One of the interesting things, George, we've seen over the last week or so is that a number of European countries are recognizing they need to reduce their own reliance on Russian oil. The type of sanctions he has on Russia is actually allowing, in my opinion, Moscow to benefit, right? Moscow is going to profit from all the oil and gas. They're not even worried right now. They're not even worried right now. You know, Biden says he defended his decision because he doesn't want to harm the world and he wants to limit the pain for the American people at the gas pump. But guess what? That doesn't, that's not the way to solve this. That's not the way to solve this at all. This is going to come back to haunt Biden. You know, people are saying right now that excluding the industry that is at literally the heart of Russia's economy just allows them to continue doing what they're doing in Ukraine. And it's not going to end there, folks. Believe me, it's not going to end there. If we don't clamp down on Russian energy, if we don't stop the flow of money going into Russia, the Russians will win this. They really will. And it's going to make it a much more difficult fight for us. It's going to make it a much more difficult, of course, battle for the Ukrainian people. And by the way, I don't want to be paying for Russia's war in Ukraine. And I don't think that you do either. Guys, before I get to Rick Prado, I want to tell you about heat holders. And I know I've talked about it before, but I'm going to talk about it again. When there's a chill in the air, like the one I felt up in Canada, nothing will keep you warmer this winter than heat holders. Heat holders makes the warmest thermal socks around. They keep your feet warmer. I'm telling you, I tested it out. They keep your feet warmer than just ordinary socks in the coldest conditions. And how do they do it, you ask? Well, heat holders uses like three-stage process that keeps your skin and your feet warm and you don't get sweaty or any of that weird sticky feeling when you're in your socks. Your socks stay dry. And that's how you stay warm. Go to heatholders.com and enter the code Sarah. And I want you to save 15% off your order. If you enter the code S-A-R-A, Sarah, receive free shipping with any purchase of $25 or more. Give the gift of warmth to everyone you love or just yourself. Remember to go to heatholders.com. Use the code Sarah. That's heatholders.com. Heat holders making life warmer. Okay, and without any further delay, I'm so excited to have on the show today Enrique Rick Prado. Rick Prado is a hero of mine, and soon he will be a hero of yours. He's one of those shadow warriors that people don't know about. He is like the silent warrior. That's what I call him. He's former um, CIA station chief for Central America, South America, and the Philippines. He's fought in classified missions all over the world. And believe me, he has so much to say about what's happening now in our world and how things could have been different if they would only have listened to him and the men and women that are on the ground doing the hard fighting and putting their lives on the line. I got to tell you, I was bragging about you at the top of the show. Um, uh, I am Cuban on part of my mom's side and learned to love my country, the United States of America, because of her. And because of her, um, how she stood up and my family stood up against communism. And after reading about you and, and after this, you know, I'm so excited about your book. You just make me proud. You make me proud to be American and you make me proud to be a Cuban American on my mom's side of the family. And my father was a war veteran. So thank you very much for your service, Rick. Thank you for everything you've done. Well, thank you. And, and uh, thank your family, too, because they've taken a role. You know, that, that is a very current occurring theme through the whole uh the book is the communist angle you know and of course it's very apropos today because of what's going on right. in ukraine but um you know i was there during the revolution um i i had guns fired right in front of my face during the scrimmage that they had when i was seven uh, i saw people hanging from trees after castro took over with signs that said contra revolutionary and um uh, from there, I came to the United States by a program called Peter Pan, which was uh, trying to get the uh, Cuban kids out of out of uh, out of Cuba into the states. And I ended up in an orphanage 
in uh, Pueblo, Colorado, turned 11 there. And uh, th that was an adventure in and of itself. But it, throughout the book, uh, you know, I, f I have fought communism in five different incarnations. So I'm very proud of that. Well, let me tell you, you know, my cousins came on the Peter Pan as well. I was the firstborn um, here in the United States. And, you know, I remember the stories of my aunt. And I'm sure your parents went through that of having to send their children forward without any knowledge that they may never see them again, that they may never see them again. You know, that, that is courage, yeah, courage, courage to personified. And it's been my battery for electricity for a long time because I'm an only child. Imagine putting your only child on an airplane to a country you've never been to. And like you, you saw it said, may well could be, you know, never, never visit. So only for freedom, not for economic reasons, because we were solid middle class in Cuba and we were below the poverty line for the first five years in the United States. So, oh, so many Cuban Americans and so many immigrants um, face that every single day. And you brought up something that I, I wanted to start off with. And I agree with you right now. We're seeing um, Vladimir Putin and his forces. In Ukraine, we're seeing, of course, all the video of the families, of the children underground, people fighting on the streets for freedom. And this is, I remember covering Maidan, and back in 2013 and 14, when the first uprising um, in, in Ukraine, and I remember the people saying, this isn't even about the change of government anymore. This is about freedom, of, of being free of tyranny, of being able to stand up and be your own person and have your own liberty without having the government push you down or kill you or imprison you for your political or religious beliefs. Talk a little bit about that, because I think that's what inspired you, right, to go into the agency and to fight for, it was to fight for freedom, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, it, it began with that early adventure, like I mentioned, but, you know, very quickly I developed a, a little bit of a guilt because my parents had sacrificed so much and I was benefiting so much from being in the United States that I realized, and there's that episode that you're talking about, the New York Post. And uh, that's the first time I found purpose. And, and for me, I've never worked a day in my life. I've never woke up one morning and gone, gee, I got to go to work. Uh, so for me, that was definitely the driving force, the, 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 the communism stuff. I am unpleasantly surprised, however, uh, how surprised people are that Putin is doing this. I mean, history repeats itself over and over and over again. He said it when he took over power that he was going to resuscitate the Soviet Union. How does that work? Take power, control the people, oppress the people, and expansionism. And it, he's not the first. You know, it starts with Stalin and, and Khrushchev and, 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 and all of those in between. So for me, for our leaders to go, oh my gosh, Putin is, is crazy. No, Putin is Putin. Putin is the quintessential Russian um, idol. You know, he's the alter ego of every Russian male. I know there's a 1% that is, that is trying to, uh, uh, you know, protest and they're paying the price for it, which doesn't happen here, I'm glad. But he, he is what he is. And it shouldn't surprise any of us that this is their intent, and even if they push, we push them back on this, or Ukrainians push them back on this, they'll just sit on it. For them, it's, it's called creeping normalcy, by the way. They will take that eastern side, and if they stop there, you know what, six months from now, you think we'd be talking about it? No. And now right. it's normal. That is part of Russia. Next time they see a sign of weakness, and, they, and next time they see an opportunity, they'll jump on it and get the other half. Let me ask you this, because I agree with you. I don't, I, I think we saw he, uh, he, and in fact, he led us on a trail. He let breadcrumbs everywhere. We saw it when he entered Georgia. We saw it with Chechnya. We've seen it with his assassination attempts and successful assassination of, of, of people that have opposed him. I mean, to the point where, I mean, we're using radiation, right? And you're, you're killing someone in, a, in another land, like in Great Britain. And you're taking someone's life with something as extreme as like radioactive poisoning or something of this nature. I mean, it's not that he's crazy. This is how he operates. He's a former KGB, you know, uh, guy. He believed in Mother Russia. He believed in the power of the Russian people and communism. So I, I'm like you. I'm like, why is everyone surprised that this guy's making a move? 
Why? Do you think he's going to back down? I mean, look, he's 73 or 74. He's not going to, I don't think he's going to back down. Yeah, uh, he, he, will, he will act accordingly depending on what we're countering with. Um, but military force alone is not going to do it, and we, we need to support. But, you know, even just before Putin, people forget, they did the same thing to Afghanistan just before the war came down. They invaded Afghanistan. They, they, they fought in Afghanistan trying to control it for, for years, and that was part of their, their downfall. Right. I think I was really fascinated, and now that you bring up Afghanistan, I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, and I covered Afghanistan during the war, you know, many years going there as a journalist, and, and uh, so I'm, I'm very connected to that region of the world. You know, there were many times, and I was, I was looking at the interview you did, which was a phenomenal interview, and everyone should look at it and see it and find it online with 60 Minutes uh, with Martin, David Martin, and I think it was just a phenomenal interview. Uh, but you talk a little bit about this. You talk about, you know, um, strategies that were things that, that should have taken place, maybe and never did. One of them was Osama bin Laden. And that you, you know, believed that there was an opportunity for, for the CIA to actually capture him and question him. Um, and, and it may have prevented September 11th. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, there, there's two uh, vignettes in the, in, the, in the book that talk about things that we should have done. Um, Bin Laden is one and the other one is at the end of the book because it was the end of my career. I tried to do something for the last three years um, that told me that it was time to retire when that, that didn't work. But I will get to that one later. But the uh, the Osama bin Laden in night we I opened a bin Laden station in uh, 1995, late 95. Mike Shorey was the chief, I was the deputy. We had a great cadre, a couple of uh, other male officers, and uh, about six or seven uh, analysts that were females, and I loved them because boy, you talk about the mother instinct when it comes to profession. They're scary. They really know <laughs> how to lock into things. So it was a fantastic little group. I didn't know anything about Bin Laden at the time, but Billy Wall, who you, who you saw a little bit of at, at the CBS program, he was our guy on the ground. Kofor Black was the chief of station there in Khartoum in, in 95-ish, in 96. And uh, he, we had surveillance on Bin Laden. We knew what he had for lunch. We knew what car he drove. We knew the routes we took. We knew how many bodyguards. We Billy is, is, is a master uh, military guy. He evaluated their posture, their weapons, their demeanor, everything. We had it down to a nap. Wasn't he close enough to him that, I mean, he was so close to him at times that, that he, he could almost touch him. <laughs> he, he was he so close, was running, right? He was running one time, and Berlin came out on his Mercedes, and Billy did one of these, like, you know, salute him. So he could, he could have poked him in the eye with a pencil, but he, we weren't wow. allowed. And that's, and that's the point. We, we raised several times three options to, to neutralize Bin Laden. Compromise him somewhere in the world, kidnap him, we call it duct taping, or whatever else the president assigns that we can do legally under you know, their, his authorities. Um, but the political fortitude wasn't there. And, and the example that I, that, I, that I mentioned is, what if somebody could have shot Hitler in 1939 Right. Or what if a guy like me would have shot Bin Laden or be like Billy, shoot Bin Laden or grab Bin Laden and bring right. him back, like you said, for interrogation? You know, you're talking the coal would have happened. The, 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 uh, our embassies in Africa would have been bombed and 9-11 probably would have happened either. So uh, it, that's the sad thing. That's the sad reality for, for us in, 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 the, in the service is that we are so vulnerable to the whims, the political whims. And when you have the lack of backbone and, 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 and lack of fortitude to carry out these kind of things, uh, the enemy knows that. The enemy knows that. I think the enemy is seeing that now. And I think you brought up such an important point because I think for a lot of people, they, you're, you're absolutely right. You're on the ground. You, un you understand being on the ground just like any soldier or intelligence officer knows what the assessment is, not the guys in Washington in the suits sitting comfortably behind their desks. And the thing is, is that they all thought that they were comfortably behind their desks until Osama bin Laden planned September 11th and flew those planes into the World Trade Center, into the Pentagon, 
and the other plane that crashed on site because of heroes on that plane that didn't allow it to go into the state, you know, into the State Department or the White House. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. Are we always on the defensive instead of on the offensive? Like, we can see what people are doing. Why don't we get on the offensive? Why is the CIA, um, the DNI, or the administrations that, it's not all, but, but the good majority of them, so afraid of being on the offensive? What's, what's the problem there? You know, I, I, like I said, politics is, is a very, very tough uh, profession. And um, I could never be a politician. Because it's, it's, it's a matter of cutting deals with people forever and ever. Um, it, it amazes me that we are ashamed to be the cowboy with a white hat. It, it, it pains me that we are embarrassed because we are the most powerful nation in, in the world. And it pains me that we are embarrassed that we are the number one fighting in the world. And all our allies are behind us and next to us. But not one of them can take point the way that we have taken point since since World War One. So it, it is it to me is amazing when you. I love history, and it, it, it puzzles me when you see when we take affirmative action against a, a known threat, we see the positive results. World War One, World War Two, you name it. Mm-hmm. The, the contrast in, in in Nicaragua, another success story, because we got involved, and yet. We make the mistakes that if you go back and see over and over again is failures, failures, failures to derail. You know, one, one of the, the mottos of, the, of, of uh, the, the counterterrorism center is to disrupt. It, there's a lot of ways of disrupting these kind of people. But we didn't do that in a, in a lot of aspects. But you did. I mean, you did with let's talk about the Iran-Contra. Let's talk about the, the Santanistas and what you did in Nicaragua and all of. And I love the part that you said to to you know, in your interview with 60 Minutes, where you were talking about like, look, there was a lot of bad press coming out, but they weren't like that. The majority of the guys that you trained, that you worked with, and you trained them, by the way, by yourself for a good period of time, right? I mean, these were good men and women that were fighting against an oppressive communist regime that was coming right into our hemisphere, just like what happened in Cuba. Well, you know, it's it's funny because I, I I had a wonderful career and I can't, you know, but that has to be the most rewarding period uh, of my life. Also, because we were successful, you know, we did some mm-hmm. great successful operations like blowing up Puerto Cabezas, and uh, which I was a part of, and, and of course the 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 fact that we were able to force the Sandinistas into a, an election that that they lost. But imagine a Cuban kid who saw the revolution firsthand, who saw in so what happened to his parents and to his first country, but couldn't do a damn thing about it. And all of a sudden, this little Cuban from Miami, I am living in the Contra camps and my, my, my sponsor is CIA. Um, every night, every single night, I would grab a cup of coffee and I would sit with a different uh, group of Contras. And I would ask him, I said, why are you here? Do you think any one of them says, well, you know, when I read Lenin and Marx, I didn't agree. They didn't even know who Castro was, some of them. Right. It was all, they burnt my church down. They beat up my priest. They raped my daughter. They forcibly conscripted my 15-year-old son. And so on and so on and so on. That is so rewarding at that level that, you know, I slept in a jungle hammock for the better part of three years. Uh, Monday through Fridays, I was in the jungles and the camps with, with the Contras. I ate with them. I got sick with them. I got shot at with them. I never, ever said, oh, my God, well, what am I doing here? No, it was the most rewarding job. You know, in, in our business, gratification usually comes down the road after a long period. Right. And, and this one, the fact that we were able to bring it to, to, to culminate was uh, a big feather. And, and the Puerto Cabezas job that we did with my divers, uh, it was so beautiful Yeah, explain for me. that, too, because I want our listeners to know, I mean, this is such an incredible operation that you were able to make this happen, that you trained people to literally be like the SEALs to make this happen. It was, it, it, I mean, regular guys, right? Well, they, they, were, they were divers themselves. They were lobster divers. And yeah. They but... used to, you know, they used to extra, you know, a little different than a, than a soldier though, right? Right, exactly. But now they had been Contras. They had been fighting. They were Mosquito Indians, which are the guys from the, from the East Coast. And um, 
I had met them during some of the combat training that I was giving them for the four, first 14 months of, of the time I was there. I was the only guy allowed in the camp, so everything had to come through me. And uh, I picked these guys when, when my headquarters came in and said, we need to do something more than raids and ambushes. We need, we need a good left hook, kind of something to get their attention, show them to be vulnerable. So I came up with this harebrained idea. I says, well, you know, I got these guys that know how to dive. I'm a military scuba guy. I'll train them up. We'll blow up Puerto Cabezas. Puerto Cabezas, the importance of Puerto Cabezas, is that, that was the belly button for s- supply and resupply from Cuba. That's where the oil and the weapons and the ammunition, everything the Russians were funneling through Cuba was coming through Puerto Cabezas and some of it going to El Salvador to incite further revolutions there. So um, I you know, spoke to my boss. He liked the idea. He sent it up to headquarters. And there's a great photograph in, in the book uh, with me with my divers and this 80 pound of C4 kind of bomb. And... Uh, the Reader's Digest version of it is, that, yeah, I trained them for about a month first, you know, after they pass a physical test and all that other stuff of compass swims, being able to get the exact point by, by swimming underwater with a compass, you know, the, the covert aspect, and of course, propping this thing up properly and arming it properly. So um, we came out of uh, Puerto Limpida in a small panga boat to meet a PT boat that was just on the other side of the, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the lagoon. And the mission did not start really well because right when we hit the edge, caught a surge, and the, the engine, the little engine of the boat fell off the transom. And I reached oh, over. I was, I was a little beefier back then. I reached over and I one-handed the thing into the boat, but then I fell o- over and there was a piece of metal in the boat and I still have the scar. I don't know if you can see it. I love it. It's a badge of honor. Uh, I uh, taped, taped it up and we... That was the only thing that went wrong in the mission. We got on the PT boat. It was timed perfectly. We, uh, it was a, a moonless night. We got within three miles at the most of, of uh, Puerto, Puerto Cabezas. Jumped in the water with my guys. They headed us the bomb, sent my guys down to, to uh, put this thing in. They came back. We went back. And by the time we were in, in uh, back out of Nicaraguan waters, Kaboom. We did it. We did it at night because we didn't want to hurt anybody. We wanted to have no collateral damage. And I will tell you, I, it is tattooed in my brain. Two or three days later, when they showed me for the first time ever for me, overhead, satellite overhead of, of the bridge, I was doing the happy dance because it was so obvious and so rewarding that I said, there's one less tentacle in that octopus that I got to worry about. That's so, yeah. right. That is how you described it. You described it as octopus with lots of tentacles, and I still see it today. I want to ask you this. I want to get your opinion on this, because my focus in Central America, even in Mexico, I look at what's happening. I see Russians moving around there. I see the oh, yeah. Chinese Communist Party moving around, setting up shop. I see Iran inside Mexico, inside Central America. I, I mean, yeah. our enemies are like right around our doorstep, right? And what's going on? And we're opening the border. We're letting people just come on in. I just got a message from an ICE supervisor that said, hey, guess what? We're not even we're not even IDing people anymore. We're just letting them in. So I just want you to know that we're just we're not even caring anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, that that is a pet, a big pet peeve of mine. You figure in Venezuela, which is a country that was a democracy that had some of the best oil in this hemisphere. Right. And the price of Toilet paper is more than their currency is worth. You know what you can do with that money, right? Um, and, and we allow it. The, the Russians are theirs and the Iranians are there in force. They own banks. They clean money. They paper individuals. They smuggle them into the United States. We took our eyes off of Latin America, which is our backyard, by the way. And in the same way that the Russians are concerned about the Ukraine, we should be a little bit more concerned about our backyard. Um because it, it is our backyard, and, and we, we, we represent democracy, not, not oppression and not takeovers. But, you know, there was a couple of things going on, too. Terrorism was a, 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 like a flashbang grenade that gets your attention. Uh, right. We were not prepared, really, uh, or trained for the counterterrorism mission. I mean, as a matter of fact, my agency, with the exception of guys like your husband and myself who grew up... Uh, in, in Ground Branch, uh, SAD Ground Branch, um, the agency was primarily gun phobic. But terrorism, 
all of a sudden forced us to start focusing on something. And, and I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, we took our eye off the ball when it came to Russia and China. And, and, uh, and I said, well, I'm not saying that we could not, everybody with 2020 hindsight could have a good, good idea. And I, I'm, maybe there is a better balance, but here's my analogy. Terrorism is like getting shot. Communism is like contracting cancer. One, you better stop the bleeding now or you're done. So when you have a mission to interrupt something that you know is going on, you, you can't be waiting days or weeks or whatever. Where with, with Russia or with communism writ large, it's a process and a progress that we should continue to see how we can fight back and everything else. But it's a longer, uh, uh, longer track. Now, imagine, you know this, governments have finite resources, both financial and, 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 and talent-wise. So if you have somebody trying to blow your, your, your White House up, where's, where's, your, where's your immediate focus is going to be? It's going to be it's at the gonna White House. Who's going to be so who's, who's trying triage. to blow it up? Yeah, it's triage and, uh, of, of, uh, for our resources. And yeah, communism was taking a second seat, but it was never off our operational directive. Never. And that's, I, I, I agree with you on that, but I feel as though we have kind of dropped the ball in a couple of areas, right? And it's something that you said was the second reason why you decided to retire, another a poignant moment in your life, right? We, we took the ball off being on the offensive, right? Instead of being on the defensive. We're like, for example, right now, what's anyone going to say if a, a, a sleeper cell entered through the southern border with, are they going to say, well, we had no idea a sleeper cell could enter through the southern border. I'm going to say, no, you're a liar. Because I can show you all the reports and I can show you me without any knowledge of classified information. I have put together enough open sourcing to show that the government was well aware that this could happen. So we kind of take our eye off the ball and then we're like, oh, we got to get a lawyer or a JAG officer to figure out if we're allowed to target this house because um, maybe there might be some civilians and we don't let somebody go in and just take the guy out. We don't need to use a big drone, right? We could just send in somebody like you. We could send in somebody who's a fighter, like my husband, a group Delta Force, Navy SEALs, like they did with bin Laden. Why didn't we do that anymore? Why are we just droning in the sky? Do they think that's better? Is it like... Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a... And I mentioned this to David. I don't recall if it made it into the, uh, into the actual interview because I'm, I'm on overload as it is. But one of the things that I mentioned was that, I mean, you know, we, um, we could have done so much more uh, and we weren't allowed to. We were not allowed to. I th and I think it's the politics. You know, the, the, the second episode that I was re referring to was at the end of my career. I, I was chief of operations at the counterterrorist center when 9-11 happened. I had just taken over like four or five months before I was overseed in a radical Muslim country where I was a chief of station. And... Uh, 9-11 happened, and everybody's hair is on fire. But about four or five months into this thing, I was sitting down with Kofor and Ben Bonk. Uh, Kofor was the, the chief of CTC, and Ben was his deputy. And I told him, I said, look, you know, uh, we, we're, we're missing the ball here. We're, we're fighting these guys in Afghanistan, but they are all over the world, and those are the ones that are important. One thing that I learned in my Latin American uh, counterterrorism tour, which I, I can't mention the, the, the country, but it's – you, you can read it, um, is that you don't go after the shooters. They're a dime a dozen and they're dumber than crap. You don't go after the heads of, of, of an organization because A, sometimes they're political, B, they're very hard to get, and three, all these organizations are hydras. Somebody else will pop up, if not two. You go, I learned that what you do is you attack the soft underbelly of terrorism and that's their support mechanisms. They're lawyers, they're doctors, their facilitators, the guys who move the money, the couriers. So my plan was not a kill them all and let God sort them out. On the contrary, <laughs> I'm not that kind of person. Some people right. think I am. Am I capable? Who knows? I think I read somewhere like <laughs> somebody said, well, will you say that? But pe some people will think like, oh, man, where'd this guy come from? And it's like, well, that's what we do in war, right? Exactly. And, and, and that's. And that's the irony of it. Well, this, this particular of, of the plan was simple. Give me 30 names of bad guys worldwide. Some narco terrorists, terrorists, whatever you want. And we put them on the books. We send our guys and gals out 
to do surveillance on them, just like Billy did in, in, in Khartoum against bin Laden. We establish the patterns of life. We know what cars they drive, what boyfriends they have, whatever the heck it is. And then we devise three operational plans for that individual. One, compromise them through you know, planning stuff in the car and calling the cops, something that's simple. Rendition operation. And if legalized by the president's signature, take direct action. Well, that wasn't like let the bodies hit the floor. On the contrary, the idea was to have these names on the wall. And then when you had chatter, like what we had before 9-11, imagine what would have happened if I would have had that team in, in August that I could have said, take three of these guys down. All of a sudden, three major figures in three different parts of the world get neutralized one way or the other. The first thing that they, they, they're going to do is hit the brakes. We've been penetrated. And right. we would have bought, at least bought us some time. That's what that program was all about. It was strictly a surveillance and an intel collection effort in planning towards the possibility that we may need to, you know, to disrupt that, that organization before they really hurt us again like they did at 9-11. And when but I they didn't want to do it. Them, well, I, I, you know, I, I actually briefed the vice president of the United States, Dick Cheney. It's in the book. I, was, I briefed him on this program, and I briefed him on one particular guy. Uh, and he, he, he was elated. He was, this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, tell your team good. He, he was elated. Condoleezza Rice was there. Um, still, we came up with the plans. First of all, we were successful in everything they allowed us to do, you know, in, in the Intel side. Right. But when it came out to actually uh, activate, um, there's, there's the, it's in the book, the story, where I'm on the, the seventh floor briefing our DDO and our DCI, and I'm there with a very, very senior uh, agency uh, division chief. Uh, and they, I, I gave them my plan, and the DDO says, uh, well, Mr. Director, as you, as you could see, there's no doubt in our minds that Prado and his team can not only do this, but get away from it, get away with it. And I went, yes, inside. <laughs> we're like, yeah, this is going to be a go. And then he said, but we need to weigh the political ramifications of this action. The division chief and SIS-5 got up, closed his notebook. The next day he retired. Um, that was... You know, and, and I'm not saying that we that we deserve the green light, but we deserved to be represented to a higher management because it was the vice president of the United States that told us to go ahead and put these things together, flesh them out, and then come back and get permission. Leadership um, decided not to uh, ever take it back up, probably in fear of him saying, hell yeah, I want it done. And then they would have right. to do it. That's an so incredible story because it is politics and it's bureaucracy. And I sometimes it just it breaks my heart for the guys because, you know, like I know, and I think so many of your friends know we we've, we've lost people we love. You know, people have given everything for their country. They put their life on the line and it's the boots on the ground. It's those people that actually like you and, and my husband and other people who have worked operations overseas that tangibly can bring back to the bureaucracy, right? To those that never go out in the field, like the facts, right? These are the facts. This is what we've got. And this is what we can do to make a difference. Do you think right now, this is one of my fears right here. And I, 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 you're the perfect person to answer this. You know, when you see communist China, President Xi, you see Vladimir Putin's operations, you see Iran, and Iran likes to use proxies. So do the Chinese. So does Russia. We have the Western Hemisphere just a complete mess right now, I, I believe, you know, and even in our country, I mean, they're seeing weakness. Our enemies are seeing weakness. Couldn't one of these nations just try to use proxies to target us or target our assets overseas or target us here and, you know, make, to make us weaker? Um, but it really be them. It, it could really be Russia. It could really be China. It could really be Iran. But then maneuvering these like terror groups or these cartel organizations to target us. That's what I'm worried Listen, about. Yeah, you, 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 are you sure you were not a CIA undercover guy? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> you, you I spent a lot of time story. traveling, but that's what I'm thinking. I would, I'm thinking yeah. outside the box. If I'm going to do something, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to 
you know, I'm going to look at where the weaknesses are and how I can do it. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm going to be smart about it. So we have to be smarter than them, right? Well, you know, the, the, back to the topic of what you were talking about, of using the surrogates as, as they do. Um, there's several vignettes in the book of where we actually were able to find out. And uh, one was against North Koreans. I uh, took down a North Korean agent who was recruiting Latin Americans and sending him into the United States um, to, in order to be a sleeper wow. cell, but also provide, um, you know, access to embargoed uh, technology, which they're always very thirsty for. Uh, I compromised this guy personally. I said about as close as I am to my screen from the guy when I threatened him. And, you know, he, he didn't he didn't take my pitch, but we we destroyed him. We, we, we took him down. We were able to uh, he got PNG and he ended up in some gulag. But <laughs> it was an eye opening thing for me. Oh, yeah. I drank champagne that night when I found out um, the, it was amazing to me that the, here you have North Koreans infiltrating people into the United States. So I did, four, I did four years of my career in, in what it was fighting communism against North Korea. Uh, I did it out, out, of, out of Seoul, and I did it as I was the head of the Korea operations. That's where I got my senior grade, my flag rank, was when I, when I took over that in 98. Uh, and I and that's got to be one this, tough assignment. That has to be like an extraordinarily tough assignment because North Korea is so closed off from the rest of the world. It's like, geez, you know? And when you're not Korean, when you're, you're like, you're like, exactly. I'm, I'm you know, and, you know the, the, the movies like James Bond that he lands in Korea for a diamond deal. That's all as you know, BS, but you know, <laughs> it's here's, here's the lesson that, and I, and I actually spoke to this to some very senior military guys when, when the Korea thing was really uh, heightened, I said, you know, the military's got a handle on what's on going on on the peninsula. You know, every weakness, you know, every strength, you know every frequency, you know all that stuff. I know, and you have your plans. However, what people are not focusing on is there are over 50 U uh, North Koreans embassies in the world. Those North Korean embassies are 90% intel officers and one security officer that keeps an eye on them. And what they're there to do is first make money for the regime. How do you make money if you're an embassy? Drugs. Smuggling, human trafficking, super notes, all that crap. Second is gaining, and I mentioned this, gaining technology that they could ship back. But the third is targeting their enemies. I hate to tell you, North Korea only has two enemies, South Korea and us. So if we, and I told the generals, I said, you got to understand that if we go to war against North Korea, we will be attacked in 50 different missions of ours in, in, in worldwide. So we better start doing what I was trying to do with these guys and make book and see who those bad Koreans are. So if we're about to pull the balloon, I can at least try to interdict these guys before they start blowing my own people up. That's such an important point. If you had Rick, I, I want to keep you on for like, <laughs> I'm, I'm flying. I'm, I, I, you're in Florida, right? Cause I am going to fly to Florida and I'm going to just sit down and talk to you. I'm going to take you out to lunch. But if I, I, I and I'm going to bring you back on the show oh, over and over. Cause everybody should have this, uh, I mean, for me, this is really fascinating because I'm, I, I believe that our, protecting our nation is a multifaceted process. We have to understand that there are people like, you know, for everyone out there listening, like Rick, that are behind the scenes that nobody ever knows about. They, they do everything they can. They put their life on the line to save our nation from like threats that we don't even conceive because it doesn't happen because of them, because you stop it, because you stop it. But I'm wondering right now, like the way things are going, the way we're heading, if there's a geopolitical shift on our planet right now, I mean, I'm seeing China rise up. We're seeing what's happening with Russia. It's like they're trying to seize power from us, like saying, you know what, U.S.? No more. You guys don't need to be number one anymore. We're going to be number one. So this is a big fight. I don't think it's just going to end with Ukraine. No, and you know, the sad thing about this, and, and I mentioned before that for me, socialism is the mask that communism hides behind. And they sell you the utopic view of everybody's going to be equal. Well, everybody is equal, equally oppressed, equally poor, equally hang hungry. And then the nomenclature of, of, the, of the government are the ones that have all the benefits because they're dictators like anybody else. Um, we, we are 
the laughing stock. I mean, if I was the KGB, I would be rolling on the floor going like, thank you. You guys are making this so easy for us because we're undermining our own society. We're dividing our own society. You know, instead of uniting our, our, our societies, political parties should not put left, right when, when it comes to the people. And a, a lot of Americans don't understand this. And the main reason my, most Americans don't understand this is because they don't know how good we have it. Ask your parents how good we have it, okay? Because right. most, most Americans, when they travel, they go, oh, I went to Mexico, and it was wonderful. No, you went to Cancun on a cruise. Go down to some of those towns and, and tell me how, how good Mexico is. Or go to even... Go to Chiapas yeah. or go down to, uh, you know, just into the little, the little uh, enclaves on the border where people live in little huts and, you know, plywood houses. They have nothing. And, and, you know, and, and part of the problem, and, and, and unfortunately, I think it happened under Reagan, we did away with mandatory service. No, notice I didn't say military duty. I said service. I honestly believe that the Israeli model of having everybody have to serve in some capacity, serving the country for two years, is, is the way to have skin in the game. And, and, the, and the example that I use is, only 2% of the U.S. population serves in the military at any given time. All right, let's add another 8% of that that are our law enforcement, first responders, and teachers. Right. Okay? So nine, eight, you're talking that 90% of the United States population doesn't have real you know, skin in the game. Because you know what? When I go vote, if you put in front of me the fact that, hey, well, yeah, we need to cut back on military because it's too expensive, and I, both my boys are in the military... Guess what my vote's going to be? No, you're not. They need more money because they need the bulletproof vest and everything else. So we, right. you know, we as Americans need to find, you know, be, be told, be, be shown how good we are instead of dividing us, highlight our strengths. And if we do that, if we can unite the people, here, we're invincible. Rick, I can't thank you enough for being here. Remember, folks, it's Enrique Rick Prado. His book is Black Ops, The Life of a CIA Shadow Warrior. You guys don't want to miss this. Black Ops, The Life of a CIA Shadow Warrior. Out now on Amazon or wherever you want to get your books. Dr. Mike Fulgens, he's America's gold expert and the 2021 Numismatic Dealer of the Year is predicting, guess what? That silver prices will continue to rise. As inflation and industrial use follow their upward trends. That's why his company, Universal Coin and Bullion, is now offering you a new 2022 genuine one ounce silver American Eagle coin at just $28 with free shipping direct to you. Everyone should own a percentage of precious metals, so call Universal Coin and Bullion today at 1 800 UCB Gold. Be sure to mention me by name, S A R A Sarah, when you call. That's 1-800-UCB-GOLD to get a tangible asset you can hold in your hand. Call Universal Coin and Bullion at 1-800-UCB-GOLD, and their expert team of representatives will help you order your $28 American Silver Eagle coin today. 1-800-UCB-GOLD. Don't forget to tell them Sarah sent you. Before we close up, I thought it would be really interesting to talk about what MSNBC um, has found. MSNBC has found that the real villains in the Ukrainian crisis are Trump and yours truly, Fox News, right? Because they're just so out of whack, these guys at MSNBC. They have no concept anymore of reality. They have no concept. This is what they are telling their five people listening to them in their audience. This is what they're saying. So PhD Sarah, her name is Sarah Kenzior. Kenzie, or I hope I'm saying that wrong, is the one speaking in this clip. But many on the left are blaming Trump, they say, for enabling Putin. And that's simply not true. I'm going to tell you why. Because the Russians had no concept of how Trump would govern when he became president. We all know that the Russia hoax was a Russia hoax. President Trump had Russia on its toes literally on its toes. They didn't understand. How is this guy operating? Who is he? What is he? They sure as heck understood Hillary Clinton. And they knew how easy it was to buy her. Remember when her husband made $500,000 off one speech and he got it from the bank in Russia? 
that was literally run by the FSB. Imagine if President Trump would have got half a million dollars for giving a speech that was literally for a bank that was run by former members of the FSB, which is like the U.S. CIA. But in Russia, it's the FSB. So, you know, the Russians really understood how easy it was to buy Hillary Clinton. And they certainly knew how easy it was to control uh, President Biden. All you have to do is read Miranda Devine's book on the laptop from hell, and you'll know that to be the truth. I want you to listen to this clip just so you can, once again, we can reiterate how really fake MSNBC's news is and the disinformation campaign that they have going on in our nation against Trump and against Fox News. Trump was installed as the president of the United States in order to weaken the alliances that were preventing Putin from achieving his goals. Alliances like NATO, our relationship with our European partners, our relationship with Ukraine. Trump was put in as a bulldozer. And he was also put in, as Malcolm said, as a bulldozer to the Constitution, to our system of checks and balances, to our system of institutional trust, and the unwillingness of people in the United States to confront the brokenness of those institutions, whether through financial corruption in recent years or age old systemic problems yeah. like the endemic racism that holds our country up has contributed to that. And Fox News, in this sense, is just an extension of that uh, long running destructive pattern. Oh, my goodness. That woman is so far off her rocker and she does not have any concept about what's going on. And the reason why President Trump even discussed the issues surrounding NATO is because the United States, and this is going back to 2019, he was the first president to say, hey, guess what? We are tired of carrying the weight for NATO. We are tired of paying beyond our fair share in NATO. Aren't we all supposed to be together? Right? I mean, if we're all together for 70 years to fight Russian aggression, Soviet aggression, Germany, you got to pay your part. Everybody who's a NATO member, you got to pay your part. We don't want to pay your part. And, you know, so what if their feelings were hurt? I don't care. You know, I am so tired. It was just like Prado said. There comes a point where you have to stop apologizing for everything, for your nation, apologizing for your success, apologizing for winning a war, apologizing for, you know, being the beacon of light for people all around the world. You know, President Obama was great at apologizing for everything that made our nation wonderful. And now we see under President Biden, he is just trying to break this nation into pieces, shatter its principles, its foundation. People like Rick Prado and others who have given their lives and spent their life fighting for this country, understand that. Understand what it takes what it takes to, to keep a nation safe. It's not easy. You know, freedom is not free. That's a real true statement. It is not free. Because the people that are doing the fighting for it and the families at home supporting those people who are doing the fight for it pay a big price. And it's worth it. If their children and their children's children and our grandchildren have a home to come to, one where they can be themselves, one where they can work hard and be anything that they want to be, to build a nation that is full of awesome wonder, right? Look at what's happening with Elon Musk. Even though I don't like Jeff Bezos, look at how cool what's happened with Amazon and, the, you know, the growth of even Amazon and space and stuff. And I'm, I'm, you know, and you know how I feel about some of these companies. But this nation has given us all those opportunities. But don't forget, it's the blood that is spilt and the people that have sacrificed their entire lives overseas in order to protect us from enemies. And believe me, we have enemies both foreign and domestic. And we all have to watch out for that. We all have to watch out for each other. And remember what Rick Prado said. We all have to find a way to unify again. We can't be ripping ourselves apart anymore. Let's find a way to move forward together. Let's find a way to tell the truth together. Let's fight for our nation together. It's worth the fight, folks. There's no other place on earth like it. Thank you so much for being a part of the Sarah Carter Show. 
Remember again, get Rick Prado's book. You guys don't want to miss this. It's like literally it's going to be amazing. Black Ops, the life of a CIA shadow warrior. Rick Prado, Black Ops, the life of a CIA shadow warrior. Thanks again for listening to The Sarah Carter Show. God bless you and God bless this great nation. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit DanaRadio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.